Ensuring you have the highest possible chance of clearing Trial of the Grand Crusader with 50 attempts remaining, also known as a tribute to insanity, on both 10 and 25 man is going to be extremely important. The cloaks even from 10 man are amazing compared to what you're likely using from Alduar. And since the first round of PTR testing, our guild has spent lots of time reviewing logs, looking at our own VODs of the kills, and just generally talking through any precautions we can take to prevent a nasty, very much unwanted wipe. Some of these tips I'm going to give you, you might even consider basic but without putting in a little bit of preparation to make sure you're set up for launch night or your first raid in illidan's words you are not prepared first we really need to think about what bosses are likely to cause the most issues or which ones might cause rng related wipes i've narrowed these down to mainly faction champions and anubarak but you shouldn't discount the worms on north End beasts or even twins ultimately though when it comes down to both of these is about all of your raid understanding the fights from a mechanical perspective and having decent ways of tracking key abilities so before we move on to focusing on the two fights being faction champs and an uber rack i actually want to just talk about just making sure you have a good way of tracking things like burning bile and paralytic toxin on north end beasts well it's actually the paralytic spray and burning spray that actually apply it to the raid so simply setting a weak aura up to track when either of those are being casted specifically on you and just giving you an audible alert to get away from people will give you a fighting chance to make sure you rocket boost away from anyone near you so it's only you that gets hit by it and gets the debuff applied to just you the same applies for twins dvm is actually perfectly fine for managing the mechanics but understand what you need to be attacking each time one of the bosses does a special ability and what essence you should have on at any given time these are the most important parts of the fight each of the bosses does two main abilities and it will always cycle through all four so as the fight progresses, it makes it easier and easier to predict ahead of time exactly what you should be doing. But you need to understand that. You need to understand when it's going to do a heal, when it's going to do an AoE. If you've been light and you stayed light essence for two special abilities, then you know you can actually safely switch to dark. Your whole raid can swap to dark and you're not going to have to switch probably for the rest of the fight but again the main thing is having a way to track this and to be honest dbm is perfectly fine for twins but anyway what i actually brought you here for let's start with faction champs as i say i'm only fixating on the two bosses that i really think will cause problems and maybe even the most prepared groups might have an untimely wipe on one of these for those of you who don't know the fight is extremely irritating i'm not going to sit here and say it's ridiculously hard but it's definitely difficult enough to warrant some preparation and to put personal responsibility on everyone in the raid to come as prepared as possible. You don't want to be that guy who just gets instantly clapped and dies 10 seconds into the fight. The longer this fight goes on, the easier it gets because you slowly start to dispatch of the enemy team one at a time. Interestingly, when I was on a podcast a week or so ago, Simon Eyes was on the show and we was all sharing our PTR experience and just our general thoughts on the encounters. Simon Eyes' guild actually just had three rogues all have a different point being wound crippling and mind numbing stacked on the enemy team at all times this way they could just keep all of the enemy together fan a knife spam from the rogues and everyone is just doing as high a dps as physically possible so this will include just aoe in if you're a strong aoe -er, cleaving if you're a strong cleave or if you're just pure single target then obviously you're just going to focus on whatever the priority target is still but ultimately keeping them all together and aoe in them down is actually an option this is definitely something that we will be trying but just not in week one for obvious reasons but anyway what can you do to prepare for faction champs because you probably sat there thinking uh, i don't know put a pvp trinket on oh that's one of them damn it firstly the enemy team hit everything and the dots are incredibly annoying especially things like unstable affliction from the warlock which makes it difficult to dispel people because you don't want to get silenced as the dispeller when i say they hit everything i mean everything they will target hunter pets warlock pets dk pets army of the dead basically anything that they can tab to essentially for this reason having what is considered a fairly useless trinket currently from yog zero lights on 10 man the 10 trinket is actually strong on faction champs 
Having 25 people on your raid dropping these tentacles to bait dots every two minutes is extremely useful. In a single use of my tentacle alone, it had the Warlock cast dots on it, same for the Shadow Priest, and even the Rep Paladin do some damage on it in a single target fashion. And that's damage that you don't have to heal through or a dot that you don't have to dispel. There's also the old ZA trinket, the tiny voodoo mask, which actually summons three adds. I didn't try this personally, but I don't see any reason it can't work just as well. Maybe, if not better, depending on how much health they've had. I've not looked into that. Obviously, I started on fresh servers, so I've not even been and done a Zola Man run. But if you've got one of these sat in the bank, might be worth checking out. Target dummies are, of course, another option and just something that can be used alongside the trinket. But the only thing I don't particularly like about target dummies is the fact they share a cooldown with your health stone. And on a fight where the incoming damage is as unpredictable as it is with faction champs, I'd much rather have the health stone on the ready just in case I need it to save my life. If you was to use target dummies, ultimately the best time to use it would be on the pool. And for this reason, it makes it even less viable in my opinion, because the majority of your DPS will pre-pot just to try and get rid of that first target as quickly as possible. So you're not even gonna have a health potion to fall back on. It is an option, but I'll leave it up to you. The next three tips all really tie in together, but I genuinely think they're things that most guilds will overlook even the top guilds. PvP gear. Now, I'm not saying get full PvP gear for this fight, but a few pieces just to get the higher stam from those bits, as well as the resilience, which is going to reduce the damage of crits or completely remove them off the table with enough PvP gear on. That's all very nice. On top of that, the set bonuses, in particular the four set, are normally pretty strong in PvP, which makes them naturally strong in this fight. As well as the gloves normally giving you something quite useful, like extra crit on flash of light for a holy paladin, for example. So even just going for the two set and making sure the gloves are included in that two set will give you a decent amount of extra health some resilience, extra resilience from using two pieces, and whatever bonus your gloves bring. Then, of course, don't sleep on the PvP trinket. Being able to break out of a stun or a fear before you get slapped in the face by the warrior because he happened to get a hand of freedom on him and no one noticed is literally life-saving. When I said all three of these tips are tied together, that's because next, having a spec ready just for this fight is not the worst idea either. For 99% of us, our PvE spec is exactly that. It's focused on maximizing output, either in terms of DPS or healing or survivability as a tank. Rarely are the good PvP talents taken, but looking at just a Paladin, for example, having Blessed Life or even Sacred Cleansing as a healer or Divine Purpose as a Rep Paladin, you wouldn't normally take. But in this fight in particular, it really is going to shine. So if you're a Holy Paladin in Trial of the Crusader and you know you're only ever going to be healing it, turning up for your first few raids with double Holy spec just makes sense. Same goes for everyone else who's expected to only fill one role for the whole raid. So you've got a few bits of PvP gear and your trinket, you've got a second spec with all the juicy PvP survivability talents. I'm guessing you know what the third tip's going to be. Most of us just never change glyphs. We've got three majors and three minor glyphs that are bis for our spec and that's it. We might swap one one glyph here and there are certain specs, but the majority can get away with using the same three majors at all times. But this fight is one where your glyphs will really make a difference. Instead of looking at a paladin this time, what about a hunter? Decreasing the cooldown on deterrence or disengage, increasing the radius of your slowing trap to save your range from the enemy melee, or as a shaman using glyph of stone claw totem for more survivability, or even thunder to knock back anyone on you even more frequently. I can't stress enough how looking at what glyphs you're using for this fight just makes life so much easier because if you look at every class, the vast majority of classes have got at least one or two really strong survivability glyphs. And generally, they're glyphs that we just never use. Okay, I feel like that's enough about faction champs. The last I want to talk about is Anubarak, or Anubarak, or Anub... Ar Ar Whatever. This is going to be much quicker than faction champs because actually, firstly, it's not an overly difficult fight. Neither does it have that much bad RNG that can happen. I say not that much RNG that can happen, but there is one, I'd say, maybe not RNG, but it, well, it is because it's bad luck. When you kite the spikes during the submerge phase, I'm sure most of you know by now or you've seen videos or guides or historic guides, whatever, 
that you're going to basically like rocket boost or you're going to use a sprint or any movement in like increase in effect. And then you're going to get hand of protection and stand next to an ice patch, wait for the hand of protection to nearly expire and then run the spike onto the ice patch. Then it resets its speed and it's going to target someone again. It can target you twice. And that's the only bad bit of RNG because you don't want it targeting the same person twice and you need to be prepared for if that happens. How we plan on doing this is to make sure that everyone understands that as soon as you kite the first set of spikes into an ice patch, if you're the one that was kiting it, you're already moving to the next ice patch. If you head straight back over into the group and start trying to kill loads of little scarabs and then you get targeted, you're going to have no movement speed increase in effects left and could quite easily die. That wasn't even one of these tips. It's just something we learned the hard way. Preparation wise though, having your guild bank looking like this and having loads of frost protection potions on the ready is going to go a long way. And you want it for the last phase. It just gives your healers a tiny bit of room for error. So the reason you're using these if you're not aware is for penetrating cold. If you don't know how the last phase works from a healing perspective, you're sat there sweating and fighting against your very nature of wanting to spam heal everyone who's taking damage because we don't like people on low health. Instead, what you're relying on are things like Healing Stream Totem, Judgment of Light, and even Shadow Priest to do all the work for us because when they're at minimal amounts of health, they're only going to take 250 damage a second, which Judgment and all of that is going to comfortably keep people alive through. Keeping the tanks healthy and spot healing those with Penetrating Cold is the only direct healing that should be going out. When Penetrating Cold is first applied, it doesn't tick for three seconds. So it gives your healers three seconds to heal five different targets for about four to five K HP and then rinse and repeat for the duration of the debuff. You'll assign specific markers or even numbers if you use a weak aura to specific healers and they'll be their targets that they're in charge of doing those quick four to five K heals on every few seconds. The thing is, if your healer is slightly slow reacting or doesn't quite manage to hit, let's say both of these assigned targets in time, one of them will die just before the heal lands. This is why the frost protection potion is important that death won't happen. The healer has his targets. Yes, he missed the first heal on one of them, but now both of them are stabilized thanks to the potion. Obviously, if the same person gets to penetrating cold twice in a row, now you're purely relying on the healer or yourself. If you can chuck yourself a heal, use a health stone or a personal cooldown, just whatever you have, really. But ideally, you're hoping that it's on five different people each time because you'll likely only get three rounds of penetrating cold maximum in the last phase. Long story short, bring frost protection potions and make sure as the boss is about to hit 30%, everyone not only cancels all of their prayer of fortitudes, commanding shouts, things like that. Anything that increases your health, but just your health. You don't want to get rid of kings, for example, because now that's going to be a DPS loss. But you want to cancel those off and in the same macro have it so it uses your frost protection potion. So that macro would just simply look something like this. And with this macro, you'll hit it at like 31, 32%. Boom, your whole raid has now got rid of their health increase, so the boss is going to be leeching less health, thus healing more, and you're all going to have your Frost Protection Potion on. This does lead us nicely onto the final point, which was also the first point, but it's extremely relevant on the final boss. Set a weak aura up just like this one that will show you extremely clearly when you have Penetrating Cold on you. And in Phase 3, whenever you see this pop up, use anything, just something. Any damage reduction cooldown, a health stone, much like I said before, just anything you've got. I can't stress that enough. Help your healers out. Getting to phase three is comfortable, but when you're in phase three and panic sets in, that's when you'll wipe. And I almost guarantee you'll wipe because you'll slowly or quickly lose targets to penetrating cold. So make sure you're prepared before going in by having a solid way to track it and then grats, you got yourself a new cloak. Or loads of drama because there's only one cloak and there's 25 people that want it because it's an absolute beast. So be sure to like and subscribe. See you on the next one.